Perfect. All right. So thanks, guys, for joining me today. Happy, beautiful Sunday here in New England. Um, we have a wonderful guest today. Her name is Laura. Um, and I actually just met Laura through, um, through my mom. But Laura is a gut health expert, I guess you would say, amongst many other things. Um, would you like to give a little background? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Laura Wolfer. I um, have a degree in biology and I have master's in molecular biology and archaeology. And what I'm really passionate about is human health from an evolutionary viewpoint of what we're actually supposed to be doing um, in eating and you know how we're living on this planet, being outside in the sun, being in nature, and how that all impacts our health versus the lifestyle most people are living where they're inside a lot and eating a lot of processed foods and just not uh, doing the things that our bodies expect us to do. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a, a really good point that most people aren't factoring in, you know, in talking about all of this, like where does our food come from? What products are we using in our house? Right. The the you know the importance of sunlight and stuff. So mm -hmm. um great. Okay, so um where would you like to take this? Can you maybe explain like the importance of gut health and what microbiome is and that gut brain connection? Sure, sure. Um so gut health is very important because for one thing, your gut is the first barrier against the outside world. Your gut actually begins in your mouth, the nasal passages, and goes all the way through. That is your gut, and that is officially outside of your body. So the gut lining inside of your body is actually the outside world because you're putting food and every, you know it's going through your mouth into your gut. So it's the actual official beginning of self and non-self and the gut lining is very delicate and fragile it's only one cell thick so if that gets disrupted in any way then that barrier between you and the outside world is broken and not functioning it's also important because it's the majority of your immune system is in the gut mm -hmm. and the, the bacteria in the gut are also part of your immune system um, most of your neurotransmitters are made in the gut. 90% of your serotonin is made in the gut, which is why depression and gut health have, you know, go hand in hand. Um, if you have gut dysbiosis, you're much more likely to have mental health issues like depression or anxiety. Um, and it's also in direct communication with your brain through the vagus nerve, uh, the gut brain connection your gut and your brain communicate instantaneously, which is why when you get anxious, you might feel butterflies in your stomach mm -hmm. or you might get you know, gastric upset if you're anxious or you know, you're about to go and give a big speech, you might you know, get gastric upset. That's because your gut and your brain are connected and they're constantly communicating. Yeah, so interesting. Okay, and so you know, in supporting our gut microbiome, how can we do that? Well, the gut microbiome is super important. Um, we didn't really even know about it. When I was in high school back in the late 80s and 90s, we were taught there's a few bacteria in the gut that you know make vitamin K, so that's important. Nobody knew the extent to the importance of these bacteria in the gut. Um, we now know that there are 10 to 20 times more bacterial cells in your body than uh, actual human cells, so they actually outnumber uh, number us, and the entire basis of life on Earth is made of bacteria and other, you know, very simple life forms. The mitochondria, mitochondria in your cells used to be bacteria, um, so they're, they're like running the show. They're very important, um, and the microbiome can be affected by a lot of different things, um, mostly by what we put in our bodies foods um, and antibiotics, cleaning products, things like that. Uh, the most important thing about your microbiome is its diversity. Mm. You want to have as many different species of microbes in your body as possible because you want to have redundant jobs. So if, if you lose one species of microbiome or microbe that makes a certain enzyme, you have a backup. You have other ones that can do the same thing and your health is robust. So that's so why it's important to eat like a divert, like, you know, always changing up your proteins and not eating just chicken. Right. So you don't want to eat just the same diet all the time. You want to try to eat seasonally and locally as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the average American eats about 20 different kinds of plants. 
um, that's their entire intake of plants and you can't count like coal crops like cabbage, Brussels sprouts, mm -hmm. uh, broccoli, those are all the same species. So that, that doesn't even wow. count. So that must, I mean, I'm, probably, I'm definitely not hitting 20. Are you guys hitting 20? In the summer, it's easier because they have the garden and, you know, we're outside yeah. eating more. But the herbs, are herbs included in that? Herbs can be included in that, yeah. Right. So you want to be eating as many different kinds of plants and that you possibly can. Um, like I said, we eat about 20. Uh, the Hadza in Tanzania, which is kind of like the, the go-to to study actual normal human diet and gut health because they're a foraging tribe in Africa that hasn't ever eaten processed foods. Mm -hmm. They're still living their original lifestyle like we would have lived for millions of years. And they eat about 600 plant species during the year. Wow. And they eat hundreds of times more fiber than we do. And their gut diversity is about 10 times more than ours. Wow. And they have so no chronic using, diseases. Yeah, I was gonna say they're using plants as a healer. Yeah, which is exactly. So, yeah, crazy, okay. Yeah. Um, and so I know that you have a specialty in understanding like soils and mm -hmm. we just had this conversation about Monsanto's and like all yeah. of the chemicals that they're putting on our foods and the pesticides. Right. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, Beyond, you know, antibiotics that we might get in our foods, like, you know, if you're eating animal products that are raised with antibiotics, you're ingesting antibiotics. There's also another antibiotic that's in almost all of our food, and it's called Roundup or mm. glyphosate. Um, and it's uh, originally developed for chelating minerals from drain pipes because it's a really good absorber to minerals and it you know, can remove scale and lime and rust from drain pipes. Oh. It's also patented as an antibiotic and it's a very good antibiotic. Um, and our GMO crops are engineered to resist the, this Roundup um, so that it will kill the weeds, but not the crops. And the way that it does that is through something called the shikimate pathway, which is how uh, plants and some of our bacteria make essential amino acids. So it shuts down this pathway in the plants so they can't make these essential amino acids and the plant dies. But the problem with that is our beneficial bacteria, about 40 to 60% of the bacteria in our gut also use this same pathway. And so when we're consuming this Roundup, we're also killing our own bacteria and we're skewing our gut microbiome towards the bad bacteria because we're killing the more beneficial ones. So, so is there a difference between like eating organic? Are they not using these chemicals on organic and, and regular stuff they are? Yeah, organic is definitely the better way to go. Um, organic foods are not allowed to have used any Roundup, but it's so ubiquitous in the environment nowadays. There's going to be a small amount in there anyway. Mm -hmm. But GMO foods, of course, are being sprayed continually with, with Roundup, and it doesn't get washed off. It gets absorbed into the plant systemically, so it's in every cell of the plant when you're eating it. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a lot of Roundup in those plants, and it's also used as a desiccant, especially in the northern areas of the world where you have a short growing season and you have a crop of wheat or corn or you know, things that need to be dried before they're harvested. And they use Roundup to kill the crop so that they can harvest it earlier. And so um, anything with beans or wheat or oats, um, corn that needs to be desiccated early can also be completely full of Roundup. So you have to be very careful about that. I think Cheerios is very high. <laughs> yeah, what are some of the, I mean, I, I read that in-depth article on the hummus, which kind of freaked mm -hmm. me out a little bit, but what yeah. other what other foods are really high in these products? Uh, so anything that, that has these cereal grains that are desiccated. So, you know, the hummus because it uses chickpeas. What if you um, buy your own chickpeas? Is that better or they still dust it on those? You would have to buy organic chickpeas. Organic chickpeas, okay. Yeah, because any chickpeas that are not organic, probably since they, especially since they take from a lot of different farmers and combine them, you know, you don't know exactly. They're they're not coming from one source. Yeah, they're being all mixed together. Um, so they would probably have a lot of Roundup on them. Oats is another big one. If you're eating oatmeal or oat-based cereal, like Cheerios, is especially high in, in the Roundup. 
um, anything like that, granola is, you know, you have to be very careful with. You can see the non-GMO label, but it also has to be organic if you want to make sure you're not getting that in your diet. Okay. So really look for that label, organic, non-GMO. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. What other things do you look for in a grocery store when you're going and buying your, in your produce or anything? As far as Roundup or as far as... Yeah, just like eating gut healthy, health. good for your gut. Yeah. Okay. Um, you want to look for non-processed foods. Um, there's a lot of chemicals in processed foods and you want to be very careful to read the labels and only buy foods that have things that are real foods, not chemicals. And one of the uh, worst things is emulsifiers. And emulsifiers are in processed foods to keep water and oil together. Like in salad dressings, you don't want it to separate on the shelf. So they put these emulsifiers in that blend the water and oil together. Okay. And those are things like uh, mono and diglycerides, carrageenan, guar gum, methyl cellulose, um, polysorbate 80. These are all emulsifiers. And what they do is when they get into your gut, not only do they disrupt your microbiome, but they also act like detergents and you have a delicate mucus layer in your gut and they disrupt that because that's what they do. They, you know, combine oil and water and they disrupt that mucus layer and that can lead to punching holes in your gut. You only have that one little cell layer thick in your gut and uh, glyphosate does this as well, the Roundup. So these are things that can lead to leaky gut, which you've probably heard of. Yep. When you have little perforations in your gut and the things going through your gut are no longer staying inside, they're uh, leaving and going through these little holes and getting into your bloodstream. And when, once they're in your bloodstream, your immune system might see them as foreign invaders and start attacking them, which can lead to inflammation in your whole body. And if it's a similar enough antigen to some other tissue in your body, it can lead to autoimmune disease. So, which is so common these days. Yeah. yeah. Like everybody has some autoimmune disease or another and it's, yeah. So, so if someone is diagnosed with something like this, they really just need to start focusing on gut health. They really do. And, and it's all about food. So yeah. it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. You just have to avoid the processed foods, avoid the chemicals, and try to avoid glyphosate as much as you can the Roundup. Eat a huge diverse amount of food, eat natural foods, try to eat local. Mm -hmm. um, another big problem with trying to restore your health is most of the foods in the grocery store have been grown on soils that have been just used and reused for decades and have no minerals left in them whatsoever. And if there's no minerals in the soil, there's no minerals in the food either. So the, the food you're buying in the grocery store might be organic and you know not have a lot of pesticides or residues in it, but it might have no nutrition, which isn't going to be helping your body. Yeah, so interesting. And what's your take on fruit? Like, so I just, you know, we've we're almost finished this 30-day no sugar challenge. Mm -hmm. And the first 10 days, we did this like gut challenge, right? And so the uh -huh. first 10 days, we cut out all fruit. Yeah. Just so that your body, right. Cause they both kind of digest in the same source of sugar. So we wanted to take that out. Um, but obviously fruit has tons of antioxidants and good fiber and stuff. So what is your take on gut health and sugar and, and fruit? Uh, I think in a whole food diet, fruit is very healthy. You know, like the Hadza again in Tanzania eat a ton of honey. They eat a ton of fruits. The fruits that you find in the wild have so much more nutrition in them. Mm -hmm. And they're also high in polyphenols, which is the dark color you get in blueberries or, you know, grapes. And that's actually food for your microbiome. Mm. So you're eating the fruit, you're feeding your microbiome. Um, you know, the fruit that you buy in the grocery store, again, doesn't have that high level of nutrition. It's on soils, it's over farmed, it's, you know, cultivars that are selected for good shipping qualities, not for nutrition. So if you're eating, you know, wild blueberries or wild blackberries, I'd say, you know, I don't think you can eat too many of those. Yeah, <laughs> if definitely. you're eating sugary peaches from, you know, the grocery store, then, you know, that's probably not as good. They're not as nutritious. Yep. Um, okay. So if, if you were to put someone on like a gut cleanse, I mean, obviously eating the quality foods, but quality for sure. Um, mm -hmm. what kind of carbs or other protocols would you have them have them do? 
what kinds of carbs? So like, so when we did the no sugar diet, we did mm-hmm. some quinoa, some sweet potatoes. It was like going to be a little bit of brown rice. You know, I was thinking more like whole plate, you know, yeah. not so much like counting your macros and, and but just being aware of having more fibrous vegetables and like clean right. carbs. Yeah. You want it as much fiber as possible because that the fiber is what your microbes are eating. You don't digest and use the fiber yourself. That's to feed your gut bacteria. And when they're happy, your whole body's happy. They use the fiber to make butyrate, which is a direct fuel for your brain and a direct fuel for the lining of your gut. And the cells just take that right up and use it. Um, also, interestingly, if you eat a lot of one food, you're adjusting, you're changing your gut microbiome. So if you stop eating sugar, you stop craving sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's because when you eat a lot of sugar, you're selecting the bacteria that like to eat sugar. Interesting. Whatever kind that might be. And then they're communicating the gut brain access directly to your brain saying, we want more sugar. So if you're craving sugar, it might be because your bacteria are craving sugar because you've been growing the ones that are craving sugar. And if you stop eating sugar for just a few days, you might stop craving it because you've then adjusted your whole microbiome. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of people found. Yeah. They were going through pretty bad withdrawals around like day four, five, Mm -hmm. and six. And after that, everybody noticed a change in their cravings, better sleep and more energy. And that's because they changed their microbiome. They no longer have a huge amount of sugar eating bacteria. They've changed it to something else. So that's where, you know, eating diversity comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, people might think, you know, they're going to eat a a plate of salad, sweet potato, Mm -hmm. and, you know, lean beef or something every day. And that's going to be my diet. And, you know, that's, probably not going to help you want to you want to change it up every day get different kinds of fiber get different kinds of vegetables um you want to get a whole diverse amount of bacteria in your gut because if you're eating the same thing every day no matter what it is no matter how healthy you're lowering the diversity of your gut yep and um and obviously you'd recommend a pre and probiotic well prebiotics are in if you're eating whole foods and you're eating fibrous foods like you know starchy tubers even like sweet potatoes um beans lentils uh anything that's got a lot of fiber in it you're probably all set for that Mm -hmm. um and as far as probiotics go we used to believe that taking probiotics every day is good for your gut health but actually studies have now showing that it lowers the gut diversity Mm, so if you're taking a probiotic every single day you're basically putting you know two or ten or however many species of bacteria are in there and usually a lot of them are the same there are like four different kinds of lactobacillus and you know you're seeding billions and billions of the exact same bacteria into your gut, which actually lowers the diversity because then there's no room for new species. And so what do you recommend for people that are, were on like high doses of antibiotics and stuff? Well, the, the latest studies are showing that if you take high doses of antibiotics and then you take a probiotic, it actually seeds your gut with just those bacteria and your diversity ends up lower. Mm -hmm. So what people should do is get out into the environment, get, you know, get dirty in the garden, get out in the woods where you're breathing in lots of different bacteria and reseed your gut that way. If you're, you know, if you're just sitting in your house and you've taken a lot of antibiotics, then there's only a few species that you're even going to be exposed to. And that's what's going to seed your gut. So you want to get out in the environment, you want to dig up some dirt, you want to, you know, get into the woods, touch some plants, sniff them, put them in your mouth, you want to get all different kinds of bacteria that way, and your your diversity is much better. Cool. Um, Parents, do you guys have any questions? (laughs) (laughs) They're like, ah. So... We have our uh, gardens here Um, and you gave, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that you can have diversity in foods, but it could be the same species. Uh, So could you give other examples, um, you know, like carrots, uh, lettuce, cucumbers, what are uh, types of um, 
vegetables and fruits and for diversity would you recommend? That for I, diversity? Yeah, that aren't the same species. Well, the best thing would be wild foods, of course, because our cultivated foods, a lot of them are exactly the same. Like I said, the, the coal crops, cabbage, broccoli, turnips, Brussels sprouts, wow. uh, there's a, a lot of other ones. They're all exactly the same species. They're all the coal crops. But um, if you were to forage, like I know Marie does, um, you Wild have so plant. many plants in your backyard. You just go there and just start <laughs> snipping away at them. So just yeah. this morning, I had a conversation with somebody, and he said he never even thought about going outside to collect his food for his salad. Oh, he yeah. Day. And so I said, that's because we live in a culture now that people go to the store. I think having your own garden is great. Yeah. But when you look at like purse lane, um, lamb's quarters. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. that's abundant right now. There's the right. diversity. Because honestly, you go in the grocery store, there really are only five, six species of vegetables available most of the right. time, unless you go to a specialty market. So that would be an excellent way to learn a few wild plants and harvest those. And there's some super easy ones, you know, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, there are hundreds and hundreds of edible plants all around you it's and just that, knowing which ones are poisonous and which ones are not exactly <laughs> so but that, that's say, not hard either could you say what you know what some of the easier ones are because i mean we have a garden and all but i i don't know a lot about um edible you know wild edible plants right where are you in the are you in the northeast yes in Mass gloucester massachusetts okay mm -hmm. um there's lamb's quarters, which grows just about everywhere in disturbed areas. And if you, you know, just Google that and look at the picture, I'm sure you'll recognize it. There's dandelion, the leaves, the flowers, the roots, all edible. Clover is edible. Um, purslane, which kind of is a low growing plant that is everywhere in disturbed areas and in gardens. Um, what are some other ones, Marie? Joy, you just saw all of those on the, yeah had here last week yeah i will um did you ever get the notes from it i wish we had been i, I wish we had come okay. to that yes yeah. i'll perfect. get the notes and then we can um i'll show you because yeah there's we took pictures and then put notes underneath mm -hmm. all of the different plants but there i mean it was remarkable just walking yeah. through the woods and just picking off leaves and it was like yeah them. and the flavor that you got from it it was unlike anything you could buy at the grocery store and there's naturally occurring bacteria on all those leaves and they're the bacteria that kind of go with those plants. So you're eating them and you're also eating the bacteria that kind of go with that plant at the same time. So it's a, it's a full package. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'll get the, um, I'll get that and post it. That would be really cool to see all those notes and stuff. And you know what I'll do, Joy? I'll put together a list of easy local ones like that that most people here would have and I'll post it on mm -hmm. your page. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and plantain is another one. Um, yeah, that's what Bob just, he showed me yep. a link this morning. Pineapple um, weed. Oh yeah, no. It was yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Um, more plants than not are edible. You'd have to look to find the poisonous ones. Right, <laughs> because I mean, most people, I think I'm a knowledgeable person about <clears throat> health and, you know, gardening, but I don't know anything about, you know, wild plant, and I yeah. think most people don't. And another so bonus is if one. you if you're eating the wild plants, you're getting way more nutrition mm -hmm. because they haven't been shipped and packed and you know their genetics are still intact. They're growing in mineral rich soils. You're getting so much more nutrition. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but it's a lot of plants that we look at as weeds. Yeah. And they're not like in that little flower bed, you know, at yeah. your house, it was just like we were picking off weeds and I was like, you can eat this, but yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. I have another yep. question. Yeah. It's kind of like because I'm uh, coming from a, um, you know, uh, you know, those times when uh, indulging in uh, uh, probably gut killers. So let's say you have you have a uh, eating a clean diet for for, you know, a month like uh -huh. I have uh, during the gut, uh, the sugar challenge. And then you go out and you have a bowl of ice cream. What does that bowl of ice cream what is the impact uh, that it has on the gut? Good question. How long does it take uh, to repair? Um, I guess that would be the uh, 
I'd like, I just like to not have the knowledge that if I in, in <laughs> what, what is it actually doing to my gut? Well, is it organic ice cream with no emulsifiers? No, Definitely well, that's a great question. <laughs> I said that, like, when we come out of this, I'd like to have some of our raw milk uh, ice cream. Oh, so. well, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, but if you did go, because uh, if we went to Jerome's raw, oh well, if, if no, if I'm you, not. I'm not. I'm, okay, I'm trying good. to understand, really. If you have been eating a good, balanced diet with no processed foods for a while, and you've gotten a robust microbiome going with diversity, and your health is good, then it won't have much of an impact at all. Okay, uh, Unless you eat ice cream every day for a week, then that's going to have an impact. <laughs> okay. Because you'll be shifting. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be shifting everything to when you eat the same food over and over, you're selecting for the bacteria that like that food. They're happy. They're eating it. They're growing. Other bacteria don't, they don't have what they like to eat. And so they, you know, kind of start disappearing. So if you eat any one thing for a long time, you're selecting for a certain bacteria and you're, you know. Oh, so you're saying we can have ice cream once a week? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> asking for a friend. Variation. Yeah. Okay. How long does it take to, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, if you have a good, uh, you know, healthy, uh, you know, gut and uh, you've been eating, uh, you know, diverse uh, foods, clean foods, unprocessed foods, how long does it take for that to uh, uh, to develop when you come from a place that that hasn't been happening? That really depends on a lot of different factors. If you are a super unhealthy person who's been eating McDonald's for 20 years, it's going to take a lot longer than, you know, you just fell off the wagon and ate junk food for a month, but you're, you know, generally I've always eaten a healthy diet and you're outside a lot. You know, if you're if you're somebody who's inside playing video games all day and not getting outside in the fresh air and sunshine, it's going to take longer. So there's there's a whole lot of factors that would be involved in that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good question. Anybody else? <clears throat> awesome. Any Laura, any other tidbits that you want to throw in here before we wrap this up? Oh gosh. Um, one more thing. Exercise also uh, increases diversity. So Great. that's another thing to keep in mind. The more exercise you get, the more diverse oh. microbiome you tend to have, which okay. is very valuable. Right. Which in, in turn goes along with good sleep and mm -hmm. reduced stress levels. Right. Because of the gut brain connection, again, stress is going to affect your gut. It's going to affect your bacteria as well because they're living there and they, you know, yeah. you're, so you're sending stress signals to them as well. It's, cr I mean, stress can have such a big role in someone's health journey, yeah. right? So if they don't yeah. manage that, then it's really hard mm -hmm. to manage all the other things underneath it. It is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really is. Are there any tests to determine the quality of your uh, biome, your gut biome? There are a lot of tests available, but we don't really know enough about the microbiome yet to really understand what it's doing and you know you can get a test that will tell you all the different species that are in your gut but what are they doing How, what roles are they playing um we don't know and again the hadza in tanzania their their gut microbiome is kind of the opposite of ours we think of well, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria those are helpful good microbes and they don't have any of those they don't have any bacteria any of those bacteria whatsoever, but they have like H. pylori and chlamydia and gonorrhea, all these like bacteria that we associate with disease are in their healthy balanced gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you know, no matter what all of these companies who are coming out with these tests are saying, we don't understand what constitutes a healthy gut microbiome. And what about, what about someone's poop? I mean, that can determine a lot about like what, how your gut health is, right? Yeah, it can, um, especially with motility issues. You know, if, if it's very loose, your gut, you know, it might be going right through you and not absorbing enough water and nutrients or, you know, the opposite of that constipation. Uh, Roundup and glyphosate, for one thing, can affect your gut motility. It can slow it down, which means, you know, things can end up stuck in your small intestine and you can have SIBO, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So it's definitely 
a, a big factor in, in checking your gut health. Everything is moving smoothly. You're not supposed to have to use toilet paper. You know, a healthy person, you know, living, say, in the Hadza tribe, who's not exposed to all these chemicals and processed foods, they don't wow. need toilet paper. So yeah. that is a good test. <laughs> well, it should just all come right out. Done, which is really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is really great. And sorry about the filter that I couldn't get. Oh, you look beautiful. <laughs> you look beautiful. <laughs> awesome, guys. Have a great Sunday. Thank you. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.